In the heart of medieval Europe, cathedrals, castles, and bridges have stood unbroken for centuries, defying rain, wind, and time itself. But hidden within their stone walls lies a strange secret. The mortar binding those stones wasn't just lime and water. It was alive. Builders mixed in hair, blood, egg whites, even beer. It sounds like magic, but it was early chemistry. A union of craft, faith, an experiment in an age before science had a name. In medieval Europe, the stones of great cathedrals, castles and bridges were laid by hand one after another by craftsmen who rarely lived to see their work completed. Yet these structures remain, standing tall after hundreds of years of storms, wars and decay. What held them together was not only stone, but the mysterious mixture between the mortar. When modern scientists began analysing samples from Gothic cathedrals and old abbeys, they found something that defied modern expectations. Embedded in the lime and sand were traces of organic matter, proteins, hair fibres, animal blood, even fragments of straw and eggshells. These were not impurities. They were deliberate additions, each one chosen for a purpose known only to the masons of the past. The discovery opened a window into a forgotten world, a world where building was as much ritual as it was engineering, and where knowledge was passed through touch, not text. Medieval builders had no laboratories, yet their walls survived longer than many modern constructions. Their secrets were hidden not in books, but in the very bones of their work. What seems bizarre today, the idea of mixing life into stone, was once common sense. In those centuries, everything in nature was believed to have its own essence, its own energy. To build something that would last, you had to blend the physical with the vital, the earthly with the living. Medieval mortar was not the grey, lifeless paste we know today. It was a living material, breathing, curing and hardening slowly as it reacted with the air. Its main ingredients were simple, lime, sand and water. Yet behind that simplicity was an art form. Unlike modern cement, medieval lime mortar did not rely on synthetic binders. It relied on patience and natural chemistry. Lime was created by heating limestone until it transformed into quicklime a substance so caustic it could burn skin. When mixed with water, it slaked, releasing heat and turning into a soft, buttery paste. That paste was then blended with sand to give it structure and body. Once applied between stones, it absorbed carbon dioxide from the air, slowly turning back into stone. But the process was fragile. If the mixture dried too fast or cracked, the structure would weaken. Builders learned to sense this balance by feel and instinct. Some said the mortar needed to be fed, like a living creature, with ingredients that would make it stronger, more flexible, more enduring. Thus began centuries of experimentation, with strange additives that blurred the line between superstition and science. To make stone breathe like flesh, they turned to what they knew best, the materials of daily life, milk, beer, blood, hair and egg. Each addition carried both a practical and spiritual purpose, blending faith with function in a world that saw no division between the two. Among the most curious discoveries in Old Mortar are the strands of hair, thin, nearly invisible threads once woven into the mixture by the hands of masons. These were not mistakes. Hair and animal fibres were purposefully added to strengthen the mortar, much like steel bars inside modern concrete. They acted as reinforcement, preventing cracks as the mixture dried and hardened. Horsehair was particularly valued. Its strength and flexibility allowed the mortar to move with the structure during temperature changes, preventing the brittle fractures that destroyed weaker buildings. In poorer regions, masons used whatever was available – goat hair, sheep wool, or even human hair gathered from barbers and monasteries. In ancient construction manuals, these fibres were described as the nerves of the wall. Without them, the mason said, a wall might stand but would not live. In a symbolic sense, the hair gave the structure a pulse, a way to stretch, breathe, and resist the inevitable ageing of time. When analysed under microscopes, these ancient fibres still show traces of the organic oils that helped them bond to lime. The builders may not have known the chemistry, but they understood the result through experience. Every strand worked as a bridge between the world of living creatures and that of unyielding stone, a fusion of life and matter. The result was not only strength, but a kind of silent harmony between nature and architecture, captured forever in the mortar's pale skin. Even more mysterious are the traces of blood and egg white found in medieval mortars, 
organic substances that to modern eyes seem almost ritualistic. Yet these additions were grounded in a surprising degree of practical wisdom. Blood, rich in proteins like albumin and fibrin, acted as a natural adhesive. When mixed into wet lime, it improved the binding strength and elasticity of the mortar, making it less prone to cracking. Egg whites served a similar role. Their proteins coagulated as the mortar dried, forming a thin, resilient film that held the material together. Builders observed that walls containing these organic elements hardened more uniformly and resisted water damage better than ordinary mixtures. Some even believed that adding blood granted life to the structure, an offering that infused strength, vitality, and divine protection. In religious buildings, the symbolism ran deep. The blood of sacrifice bound the stones of God's house. The practice was not unique to Europe. Across the world, from Chinese pagodas to Middle Eastern forts, artisans used animal blood or eggs in their plaster and mortar. This convergence hints at something universal, an ancient intuition that the substances of life could give endurance to what was otherwise lifeless. To the medieval mind, there was no divide between the sacred and the scientific. To add blood or egg was to honour both. Their mortar was not just chemistry, it was theology hardened into stone. Beer, milk and brine the ingredients of a tavern or kitchen, were also found in the mortar of medieval walls. To modern engineers, this might sound absurd, but for medieval builders, these were powerful natural tools. Each one changed the chemistry of the mix in subtle but significant ways. Beer, rich in yeast and enzymes, stabilised the lime's reaction with air and water. It slowed drying, allowing the mortar to cure gradually and evenly, reducing cracks. Some builders claimed that beer kept the mortar happy, an expression that revealed both humour and intuition. The residual sugars and proteins from fermentation helped the mix retain moisture, creating a smoother, more workable paste. Milk, especially sour milk or buttermilk, contributed casein, a protein still used today in eco-friendly paints and adhesives. It added binding strength and gave the finished mortar a slightly waxy resilience against water. In some monasteries, where waste was frowned upon, Spoiled milk found new purpose in the walls of cloisters and chapels. Salt water too played its part. A small amount of brine could help regulate pH levels, preventing the mortar from turning too alkaline or too weak. Builders along the coast often used seawater by necessity, later realising its benefits for durability. These ingredients came from daily life, not laboratories. To medieval craftsmen, construction was an extension of the natural world. Food, faith, and building were not separate acts. They were all part of the same living experiment. Beyond chemistry, these practices carried deep symbolic meaning. To add hair, blood, or milk to stone was not merely technical, it was spiritual. Builders believed that life itself could be shared with the structures they raised, ensuring that those walls would stand, breathe, and endure. In many regions, construction began with ritual. A small animal might be sacrificed, or a few drops of blood mixed into the foundation mortar as an offering. It was said to feed the stones, granting the building a soul. Such rituals were meant not as cruelty, but as acts of protection, ensuring that the structure would resist collapse, lightning, or evil spirits. Some chroniclers wrote that the first stone of a cathedral was laid with blessings and with blood. The idea was that human and divine effort met in that mixture, a sacred cooperation between the mortal builder and the eternal, this blend of faith and practicality shaped medieval architecture in profound ways. Cathedrals were not just built for God, they were infused with him, stone by stone. Even bridges, walls and mills carried traces of belief, a conviction that strength came not only from material but from meaning. In a time before science could explain resilience, faith filled the gap, and in doing so, it gave medieval builders something modern engineers sometimes forget the sense that every structure, however humble, was alive. Medieval builders had no formal science, no laboratories, no chemical equations, no manuals printed in ink. What they possessed instead was something more intuitive. Generations of observation, failure and adaptation. Every batch of mortar was an experiment, every wall a lesson written in stone. A mason's apprenticeship could last decades, Young craftsmen learned not through lectures, but through the senses, the feel of the lime paste between fingers, the smell of it curing in the sun, 
the sound of a wall settling overnight. They knew when the mixture was right by its rhythm, its breath. Too dry, and it cracked. Too wet, and it sagged. Precision was achieved not through measurement, but through touch. When something failed, when a wall flaked or a vault collapsed, the masons took note. Over time, patterns emerged. Adding horsehair reduced cracking. Mixing in milk made the surface smoother. Beer improved workability. These findings were preserved in the only way knowledge could survive then, through word of mouth. Masters whispered formulas to apprentices as sacred secrets, guarded like relics. Different regions developed their own formulas based on climate, soil and available materials. In damp England, builders preferred lime that breathed. In sun-scorched Spain, they added oil or egg whites for waterproofing. Each solution was born from trial, error and intuition. Proof that even without formal science, medieval builders were empirical thinkers. Their architecture was, in its own way, a slow collective experiment written across centuries. In recent years, scientists have turned to ancient walls for answers that modern materials cannot provide. Through chemical analysis and microscopic imaging, researchers have confirmed the presence of organic matter. Proteins from blood and egg, fibres from hair and straw, enzymes from fermented liquids. These discoveries reveal a sophistication long underestimated. Modern engineers now study medieval biological mortar to learn how it healed itself over time. The organic additives allowed moisture to pass through while preserving flexibility. When microcracks formed, lime particles reabsorbed carbon dioxide and sealed the fissures naturally. What medieval builders achieved through instinct is now being replicated through biochemistry. In one experiment, researchers at the University of Granada recreated a 13th century lime and milk mortar. It proved more resistant to temperature changes and humidity than standard cement. Others have revived egg white mixtures that harden slower but remain stronger for centuries. The irony is striking. In trying to build smarter, modern science has turned backward, rediscovering what the past already knew. This doesn't diminish progress. It reframes it. The medieval masons were not primitive. They were experimenters of the tangible world, guided by senses rather than machines. Their science was tactile, slow and reverent, but it worked. Under the gaze of microscopes, the truth becomes poetic. Within the veins of stone still flow traces of life. Milk proteins, horsehair, yeast. The medieval dream of giving life to architecture was not superstition. It was astonishingly real. Modern cement is a marvel of speed and strength. It hardens within hours and supports massive weight. Yet, in its efficiency, something vital was lost. Flexibility. Medieval mortar, slow to cure and rich in organic matter, had a living quality that modern materials lack. It could expand, contract, and even heal itself with time, allowing buildings to survive centuries of shifting earth and changing climate. Modern concrete, in contrast, is rigid. Once cracked, it cannot mend. Water seeps in, corrosion begins, and the structure decays. Cathedrals built in the 12th century still stand firm, while many 20th century buildings crumble within decades. Engineers now call this paradox the wisdom of slow architecture. Medieval builders worked with patience. They allowed time to do the curing. The biological components they added acted like shock absorbers, distributing stress rather than resisting it. Every ingredient, gear from hair to beer, served a role in creating balance. Today, some restoration specialists are returning to lime mortars inspired by these medieval recipes. They value breathability and adaptability over brute strength. The goal is not to dominate nature, but to coexist with it, just as medieval builders did. Perhaps that's the truest lesson of all. Progress is not always a straight line forward. Sometimes it loops back to rediscover what ancient hands already understood. That buildings, like people, endure best when they are allowed to live, to flex, to breathe. In the end, the story of medieval mortar is not just about chemistry or construction. It is about faith in craft, patience, and the belief that even stone can hold a soul. Every drop of blood, every strand of hair, every sip of beer stirred into the lime was an act of devotion a quiet conversation between the builder and the world he shaped. The masons who mixed these strange concoctions were not simply workers, they were philosophers of matter, 
They believed that the act of building was sacred, that to make something last one had to invest a fragment of life into it. In their worldview, mortar was more than a substance. It was a bridge between the living and the eternal. Centuries later, their work still breathes. The walls hum softly with memory. Touch the stone of an old cathedral, and you touch the fingerprints of men who believed that creation required communion between human hands, natural forces, and something divine. Perhaps that is why those walls still stand, not merely because they were built well, but because they were built with belief. In an age that worships speed and machines, the medieval way offers a reminder that true endurance is born from care, from slowness, from faith. The mortar of their world was made not just of lime and sand, but of reverence itself.